Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jocelyn Rose Trivet, and I'm presenting a collaboratively written chapter called Sustainability, Education, and Prisons, Transforming Lives, Transforming the World. Where did that? No, there we go. OK. So I want to start with a world-class composting facility. This is 50 miles northeast of Seattle in a warehouse size space at Monroe Correctional Complex. It started as a small worm farm, a way to reduce the food waste disposal costs for this facility. It quickly ballooned in ambition and scale, mostly because of the ambition and charisma, the energy of this man, Nick Hackney, who is credited as the founder of the program. He initiated correspondence with the world's experts on composting. He figured out what supplies and equipment they needed to get. And then the team, which was inmate technicians and DOC correction staff and a horticultural instructor was helping as well. They built bins for breeding and composting with worms. And the team started with 200 starter worms in 2010 and grew them to 7 million by last year. They're currently processing nine tons of food waste each month, and 22 men have served as technicians in the program. From the start, the team fostered a culture of education and outreach, and everybody in the program, and I've visited it many times, is excited to talk about what they've learned, their expertise, and their experience in the program. Many in the program say that it's been their first experience with science. It's also a, an escape from the chaos and stress which is typical of prison. It's a place where they can do something worthwhile and build skills that'll be useful to them when they're released back to the outside world, which all of them will be. Many of them say that they found a sense of self-worth in the program. They say that it's the first place in prison that they experienced peace. That slide isn't supposed to be there. This is an old version. Uh-oh. Well, OK. I'll try to roll with it. Seven years of the program, the team continuously innovates. Their most recent enterprise is uh, working with black soldier flies. And those larvae um, consume post-consumer food waste at an impressive rate. And then they take the excess larvae and donate them to local zoos. The program has become an international model for composting. And they've had hundreds of visitors who've been impressed by the professionalism of the technicians in the program and their knowledge and expertise. Prisons might be the last place that you would expect to find an innovative environmental program like this one. Prisons are designed to contain and control the people they house. People outside of the fence typically ignore and discount the people within. We've thrown them away. In contrast to those stark realities, though, there are beautiful initiatives blooming across the United States and in facilities worldwide. These are extraordinary partnerships among correction staff, inmates, academic institutions, other government agencies, nonprofits, community volunteers. And together, they're creating programs that offer sustainability education, recycling, endangered species recovery, gardens. In a country that houses more prisoners than it does college students, the country we're in right now, 
offering sustainability education in prisons has at least two powerful effects. First, it does something for the people inside. It gives them something positive and productive to do. It creates opportunities for them to work on their skills and build a better life. Second, it is necessary to develop and nurture diverse, talented environmental stewards and environmental justice activists. It creates more people who are invested in the transformational work of creating a just and sustainable world. So the organization I work for, Sustainability in Prisons Project, or SPP, it's a partnership that was founded by the Evergreen State College and Washington State Department of Corrections, and we are now joined by dozens and dozens of other organizations and hundreds or thousands of individual partners. We are the umbrella organization for many of these activities nationwide, and we act as a point of contact internationally. Oops. But there are programs like this all across the country and around the world, and with participants at every level of security. Every prison in Oregon has sustainability programs, reclaiming materials, conserving resources, and growing pesticide-free food for humans and endangered species. We've got state and county correctional, correctional institutions and, uh, and jurisdiction-wide systems being regularly recognized as leaders in sustainability. There are several uh, states involved in a sagebrush in prisons project in which prisons are growing native sagebrush for sage grouse habitat restoration and at the same time receiving education in restoration ecology. Prisons in Maryland have extensive farms, beekeeping, uh, pet programs, and beautiful flower gardens next to living units. The state of Ohio also is seen as a leader in this movement, and again, they have a suite of sustainability programs at every facility statewide. One of the founders of SPP moved to Utah and has started lecture series in the jails, the jail and the prison there. Utah's a small state, population-wise. A team worked on uh, a correctional institution for women in Iowa and built extensive therapeutic gardens, including this gorgeous outdoor classroom. That was interesting. There is an SPP Tasmania, which I need to go see. Um, there is a ecological restoration being carried out by England's Ministry of Justice and there is the Sustainable Practices Lab in Chile in a prison. We know of 35 states that have or want to have programs like this. You can see from the map that North Carolina has expressed interest, and I counted nine totally separate instances of folks reaching out to us from North Carolina, but as far as I know, there are no established programs. I'd love to discuss or find out that I'm, that I'm wrong. So what is this about? Why all this interest for doing and learning about sustainability in prisons? Again, I see two reasons. First is what it does for the people in the prison, and second is what it does for the environmental movement itself. I'm gonna talk about what it does for the people in prisons first. Pretty much everybody in prison needs opportunities for healing and redemption. They've been hurt, they've been traumatized, and they need access to therapeutic spaces and activities so they can rebuild themselves and rebuild their lives. Many of them also sorely want ways to give back, to contribute, so that they can have that feeling of redemption. Oh, I was gonna say, 
those two needs for healing and redemption, we've seen them satisfied at least to some degree within these programs, and I'm gonna describe some of those ways. Where the program, the model is collaborative and the prisoners are treated as full partners in the program, the work itself can be transformational. Where they have, um, where they're developing their pro-environmental attitude, we know from research that pro-environmental attitudes are linked to pro-social attitudes and pro-social attitudes are really helpful for successful re-entry back into community. So it means that building those, those positive feelings about the environment also makes people build that more cooperative, helpful attitude that will help them succeed when they're released. Then there's the power of just contact with nature. There are masses of research, as you probably know, about how contact with nature is therapeutic. It's healing. Sorry, I'm not sure what I'm doing to make that happen. Um, a study in a maximum security Oregon prison found reduced violence in this maximum security space just from adding nature imagery to a recreation room. And then there's recidivism, which is the word for the rate of return to prison, so people who are released and come back. There have been a few environmental programs in prisons that have shown that we can actually move this number with those programs. The, um, there's lower recidivism for participants of Rikers Island horticulture therapy program, and there's even lower still for a Chicago-based program. Um, it's a re-entry program offering work experience with honeybees. Very, very low recidivism. This all lines up really well with rigorous meta-analyses by the RAND Corporation that has found that education is the known successful way to reduce that return to prison. <clears throat> and then criminal justice administrators and policymakers are taking notice of that it also saves a lot of money. I think somewhat, an earlier speaker was talking to how much money you can save by offering education at the front end. And then in a corrections facility, if it's sustainability education, then they can hope for that kind of cost savings too. Okay, so now I come to the second reason for offering sustainability education in prisons, and that's for the sake of the environmental movement itself. We're 65 years into the modern environmental movement, and most people in the world still see environmental action as purely optional. It's something that they could do and would be nice to do if they had the time and money. They might see it as uh, inaccessible or elitist, um, and certainly not part of meeting the day-to-day -day needs Environmental action is at a distance from daily life. Thinking about why this is, um, I did a search for environmental education, an image search, and I'm showing you what the top returns looked like. These images are fine and they show a really narrow world. I think we want an environmental movement that is widely relevant, resilient, and adaptive. And that means including all stakeholders, all people. I think we want a social approach to environmental education that recognizes that all our fates are intertwined, all races, all cultures, all 
levels of income and education, that we all need access to uh, environmental goods, and we all have something to contribute to environmental recovery. We have a lot of recruiting to do. I always look at that man, that student who's looking at the camera and think, I, I want to reach him. I don't know why. Some, it's just a really good photograph for me. So especially for these folks who are having trouble meeting day-to-day -day needs, we've got to find a way, many ways, to make environmental action accessible and beneficial to them so that they become a part of it day to day, every day. So we're seeking out ways to make environmental education relevant and meaningful and attractive to these unconventional learning, learners, or these un unconventional students. After all, that's why I think we want them as allies, because they're non-traditional students. They're gonna bring new ideas, new energy, innovation, practical ideas. So I'm going to share what we've learned about how to make environmental education those things from our work in prisons, and I'm going to be echoing a lot of what folks have already said, so I'll move through it pretty quickly. First is, oh, I'm supposed to still be here. Sorry, I'm a little thrown off because the slides are different than what I've practiced with. Um, we want, we want environmental education that is experiential, experience, that offers experiential learning. We've got as many modes for engaging with the topic as possible. Hands-on experimentation, drawing pictures, videos, audio files, specimens to examine, demonstrations with vultures are very important, and storytelling. Okay, second is that pro-social motivation, top, tapping into it, helping students um, see and also help, and then having them help us choose what topics give them something that they um, that is useful so that they can help others. What can it give them something to offer to the folks that they love or to a larger cause? Third is community based learning. And so that's connecting whatever the topic is to community, both the ones they already inhabit, like their, their family, their culture, the town they come from, or in support of new community, like a class cohort or a program partnership. We took data from a few years of our lecture series at two prisons um, and rated each presentation on these three elements and then compared those results to how much students' minds were changed to the positive about the environment for those same lectures and found this really nice correlation, this nice line you see here. And so this means that experiential learning and then pro-social, community-based content was successfully changing their minds about the environment. A lot of the programs that I know at SPP have developed to offer these things more or less organically from, from the grassroots, but there aren't many standard curricula that offer these, these elements that satisfy these needs. Most curricula uh, don't meet the needs of students who don't have conventional academic skills. Oh, dang, I lost my favorite picture. So sorry, Liliana. Um, lots of environmental curricula represent the environment either as 
a pristine, idealized environment of which nobody has a learned experience in that, in that classroom, or as global scale gloom and doom, which depresses action rather than motivates it. Okay, so I wanna spend a few minutes um, talking about a program, an environmental literacy program called Roots of Success. It was developed by a team at San Francisco State University, and we learned about it from Ohio Corrections, where it's been widely adopted. This program was, is designed to meet the needs of those learners who haven't been well served by the conventional, traditional academic, academic system. The course offers multimedia material, small and large group activities, lots of discussion, and many ways for each student to connect what they already know from their own lives to what they're learning in the classroom, and then apply both to real world issues and job opportunities. The program aims to prepare graduates for more than 100 jobs in sustainability fields. The program is challenging, it encourages critical thinking, and it's solutions oriented. It, and it can provide a positive experience in the classroom that could pave the way to further academic pursuits. One of the most powerful and unique things about this Roots of Success program in prisons is that it's taught by incarcerated individuals who have been trained and certified to lead the curriculum. I love it that they are not dependent on staff time or outside visitors for their classroom time. They can build their own learning community and develop their own relationships with the material and come to their own conclusions. Okay, I wanna read a quote by one of the Washington trainers. His name is Cyril Waldron. Oh, and this is about his students. We are introducing them to the world, a world they never knew existed, by exposing them to concepts that were previously foreign to the vast majority of them it's not that they do not have the aptitude or attitude to learn, but have been denied the opportunities. Okay, I wanna end with strategies for inclusion. How, how we can take the most unlikely partnerships in prison and turn them into success stories. Always be looking for new partners, thinking bravely and creatively about who you're not working with yet and reaching out to them, figuring out how to make what you're doing attractive and how to welcome them in. SPP programs have been started by, started by and improved by every kind of partner from top level administrators to corrections officers, to inmates, graduate students, scientists, community volunteers, everybody. Find common ground. So with those new partners, it's worth the time and effort to find out what each person wants, needs, is interested in their resources and their limitations. And then as, those, as that information is shared, I'm always looking for places where things overlap, and then I point to them and say, I see something there. And if any of those ideas resonate with the group, then that's what I pursue further. And then pursuing further means communicating more, and then again, and again, and again. I find that it really helps to like the other humans Considering how everyone can benefit with everybody involved, all the stakeholders, all the partners, all the students, going to them, 
and asking them what they need, what they want that they could get from this work, and then taking action on their input. Agree to shared values. Also foundational work and similar to finding common ground is taking the time and effort to find out what folks are motivated by, what values and beliefs they hold. And again, looking for those areas of overlap because those are where the strength is. Our strengths are in the partnership. The Venn diagram on the right shows uh, SPP's core values, and it's in the chapter if you need to look at the details. But I just wanted to give you an idea that the, the work and energy and detail that we've put into agreeing on shared values. And the smallest text is the examples of what we're, what we're getting out of each sphere of sustainability that's represented there. Then once those values are established, we codify them so that they can guide planning, expansion, and day-to-day -day work. SPP has five essential components, um, and we, everyone in the Washington programs ha has committed to these, and then also all of the network sites um, across the country. Never stop asking for ideas and input. So even though the program's going great and has been going on for years, we still go back to as often as we can and ask anybody who will talk to us, how is this going for you? Tell us what it's like. Tell us how it could be better. Tell us what's the best part. And finally, my favorite part, recognizing and celebrating contributions. Those are... Um, graduation certificates that they're holding up there. So in the Washington model, we are, con we are always recognizing people. We're continuously publishing stories about individual and group accomplishments. In Roots of Success programs, and this is a, this is a picture from that, we have every class ends with a graduation, and those events are total love fest. It's, it's ridiculous. Just outpourings of admiration for the contributions of each person as well as the greater whole and so much about commitment to the program and environmental empowerment. So I believe that the principles and the strategies that I've been describing here can apply much more widely. This isn't just about working in prisons. This is about a model that can work anywhere where offering environmental education and opportunities to people who aren't doing that now can bring a, can bring a big benefit to them. So we can see these, this kind of work, these kinds of partnerships, as a way to raise standard of living at the same time that we're energizing action outside of the current mainstream. So I see sustainability education in prisons as a way to transform lives so that we can transform the environment we see the dual crises of United States criminal justice system and then the global scale environmental challenges and we have a way to respond to them both at the same time. The visitors to prison can support and empower and provide benefits to the people in prison and staff and inmates can play key roles in transforming the world. My huge thoughts to, or <laughs> thoughts, my huge thanks to my brilliant co-authors and to the many lovely and exceptional people who contributed to the chapter and to the presentation and to many folks I forgot to list here. And 
please just know that I think the world of you.